Welcome. I am Kathy Randall, and it is an honor, a joy, and a privilege to welcome all of you to the 2014 induction ceremony of the Alabama Academy of Honor. The Academy of Honor was created on October 29, 1965, by the Alabama Legislature to bestow honor and recognition upon living Alabamians for accomplishments and service benefiting or reflecting great credit on this state. The membership of the Academy shall not exceed 100 members, excluding the governors who are automatically members. We are blessed today that the Reverend Gerald Holloway, Rector of St. Francis Catholic Church in Tuscaloosa, will lead us in our invocation and in blessing of our meal that will follow. Father Holloway. Let us pray. We stand before you, almighty God, conscious of our limitations, but aware that we gather in your name. Come to us, remain with us, enlighten our hearts. Be with these inductees who began anew today. Give them light and strength to know your will, to make it their own and to live it in their lives. We ask you to guide us most especially these inductees by your wisdom, support us by your power, for you are creator of all things. In you, God, all things have their beginning, continuation, and end. Grace these men and women and all of us who continue with continued presence and constant help. Unite us to yourself in a bond of love and keep us faithful to all that is true. Temper justice within us so that all our decisions may be pleasing to you. And for the food that we gather at lunch, we ask you to bless it and those who prepared it. To you be glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. It is always special when our governor welcomes us to the Capitol, and this is the 12th consecutive year of this tradition. Governor Robert Bentley is taking our state to the next level, standing on the shoulders of the giants who are his predecessors. It is with great pleasure that I ask the Honorable Robert Bentley, Governor of the State of Alabama, to bring his greetings to the Academy. Governor Bentley. Well, good morning, everyone. And, and uh, I would like to welcome you uh, to this uh, great historic building that we have here in Montgomery, uh, our capital. Uh, at this particular day, where we have so many uh, special inductees into our Alabama Academy of Honor. You know, I, I said the first time that I, I came uh, to do this, uh, obviously I probably would not be here except I'm the governor. You know, the governors automatically get in this, so. Uh, but y'all are here because of what you have done. And uh, I, I would like to honor you for what you have done. And I, I, I'd like to just say a few words. You know, we make this very formal. Uh, I'm not a real formal person, as most of you know. Uh, so I'd like to say a few personal words about uh, some of our inductees. We have uh, some really special inductees today. Uh, Dr. Bonner, Judy Bonner, uh, thank you for what you've done at the University of Alabama. Uh, you know, you, you, you came up kind of through the ranks, and uh, you have done a fantastic job, and when we see 36,000 students at the University of Alabama and what you have done. I just want you to know how much I appreciate it. And, and, and what I'd like to say is uh, my son, who was in your department uh, when he graduated there, he, he always thought so much of you. And I, I just want you to know, and I've enjoyed my relationship working with you. Thank you for what you have done. Uh, Tim Cook. Where is Tim? Tim? Uh, I want to show you something, Tim. Uh, actually, I carry uh, two of these. Uh, 
I, I can't operate either one of them very well. <laughs> and, and, but you, you'll show me how to do that. But uh, obviously, uh, like Forrest Gump said in the movie, uh, they bought a, uh, a, some type of fruit company. Uh, and, and, and so this is, this is the fruit company, and, and thank you for what you have done. What you mean to the state of Alabama, uh, as you know, uh, Tim Cook is a graduate of Auburn University, and uh, he has done a, a, some special things for, obviously, this great company, but he does the same thing for the great state of Alabama, and I, I want to thank you for that. John Crow, John Crow, where are you, John? There we are. You know, uh, John made a choice in life. Uh, he made a choice on whether or not he would go on and play professional football because he was a great player at the University of Alabama. Uh, but he had something else that was tugging at his heart, a and that was the children of this state who needed a home and who did not have a home. And he probably, single-handedly, with his wife, with his family now, probably has affected the lives of more people than anybody in the state of Alabama. And John, I want you to know how much I appreciate that. No one will ever know until we get to heaven and you will never know until you get to heaven how you have changed the lives of the people of this state and of the children in this state. So God bless you and thank you so much for what you have done. <laughs> Jim Hudson, where is Jim? Here's Jim. Jim has done something very special in the state of Alabama. Uh, a a co-former of Hudson Alpha, uh, he has done a spectacular job uh, of bringing something to this state that uh, we have pushed, I have as governor, uh, and that's the production of jobs out of ideas, out of innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, by creating the Hudson Alpha Institute in Huntsville. And this institute uh, was able to secure uh, all of Stanford's genomic people, all their genetic people were recruited to come to Alabama and be involved in this institute. And right now, what they're doing in this state by mapping out some of the children who do not have a diagnosis. So many children are born with defects and they don't have a diagnosis, but they're mapping these children so that parents will know what it is, what is causing it, and whether or not they can have other children safely. And I wanna thank them for what they do. They do a fantastic job. Jim testified for me at uh, that National Governors Association. I'm the chairman of the Economic and Commerce Committee of the National Governors Association. He came up and testified, and I think all the governors were very impressed with, with what you did, Jim, and what you have done. And so thank you very much, Jim. <laughs> Margaret Porter has devoted her career to public service in her hometown of Birmingham and in the city of Mountain Brook. Uh, she has done a, a tremendous amount of life work uh, in helping the quality of life for our children and adults. Uh, she loves her community. She loves the people that she serves. And Margaret, I, I want to congratulate you so much for uh, being a part of this induction group. Edgar Weldon, where is Edgar? Edgar Weldon, Edgar. I've known Edgar many, many years. Uh, he is a, he, he truly is a, one of the finest Alabamians uh, that I know. And I want to thank him for all that he has done and continues to do
for the state of Alabama. And in fact, if we work on it correctly, we're going to have the World Games in Birmingham. And it's primarily because of Edgar Weldon and what he is doing right now as far as this preparation. Now, I won't be governor then, and he may, I hope he's still around, uh, <laughs> because it's going to be about eight or 10 years from now. Uh, but, uh, but I want him to know how much I appreciate uh, what he does for the state. And Edgar, thank you for your friendship. Senator Jeff Sessions. Senator Sessions, one of the finest, finest gentlemen that I know. Uh, he is not only a fine gentleman, he represents us with integrity and dignity in the Senate. Uh, he is a man that uh, people always look to. Uh, when, they, when they think of honesty and integrity, he is a the man they look at. Born in Camden, Alabama, just like our Lieutenant Governor, we have, and, and so was uh, Joe Bonner. We have a lot of people from Camden. Uh, and so uh, all of you left Camden, I don't know. But, uh, you, but uh, we are so honored to have you, Senator Sessions. You do such a fantastic job in representing the people of the state of Alabama. And I am honored to call you my friend. Well, and everyone knows Coach Nick Saban. Uh, he had his picture made by about half of y'all a while ago. Uh, it's the only time I've ever been somewhere nobody wanted their picture made with me. I just want Coach Saban to know how much I appreciate what he has done for our great state. Not only is he, is he a great football coach, and he is. He's the best football coach probably football has ever had. But he's an even greater Alabamian and a greater person because he cares for his players, and that's what a great coach does. And he gives them chances to improve and, and to grow and to become men and to go out into the real world and, 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 and really make something of themselves. But he and his wife, Terry, uh, really bought into our communities our community of Tuscaloosa, uh, the state of Alabama, when we went through all the difficulties that I had to lead the effort on, and that was after the 2011 tornadoes. Uh, they did a fantastic job, and, and, I, and maybe tragedies always bring us together, and, and, and it helps us become more unified. But it's obvious that that happened in this case. And Coach Saban, I want to thank you for you and Nick's kids and all the things that you do outside of the arena of football. You do it because you love people, and I want to thank you for that. Now, Kathy, I want to tell you, where is Kathy? I want to tell you how sorry I am to take all your time here. But uh, I, I did want to personally say some things uh, about the, the inductees. And I, I just think that we have a great group today. And uh, I, I want to say that this, I'm honored as governor. First of all, I'm honored to be your governor. But I'm honored as governor to uh, be a part of this group. Uh, Diane, my wife, and I, uh, she, she has been to to all of these also, uh, and uh, we just want, to, want you to know how honored we are to be with you today, and God bless you. Thank you so much, Governor. Some of the other leading officials of our state are in attendance today. I'd like to introduce each of you and ask you to stand, but would you please hold your applause until everyone is standing and we will thank them all together. Lieutenant Governor Kay Ivey, Attorney General Luther Strange, State Auditor Samantha Shaw, Secretary of State Jim Bennett, Treasurer Young Boozer, Commissioner of Agriculture and Industries John McMillan, and our beloved First Lady Diane Bentley. Thank you all for being here today.
so many current members are here today, and it is a joy to recognize each of them. When your name is called, would you please stand and remain standing? We'll applaud after all have been recognized. And if anyone surprised us and came uh, and we weren't looking for you, will you please let us know loudly so we can welcome you as well. Gail Andrews, Leah Rawls Atkins, all the way from Oregon, Tom Bartlett, Claude Bennett, Robert Bentley, Tom Bradford, Ed Bridges, David Bronner, Bill Cabanus, Tom Carruthers, Mason Davis, John Denson, Wayne Flint, Jay Googe, Mike Goodrich, Miller Gorey, Fred Gray, Seth Hammett, Elmer Harris, Jim Harrison, Jim Jenkins, Barbara Larson, Don Logan, Jim Martin, David Matthews, Charles McCollum, Charles McCrary, John McMahon, Vaughn Morissette, Beverly Pfeiffer, Roger Sayers, Bill Smith, Jim Stevens, Lee Steisingler, Mike Warren, and Odessa Walfuck. Thank you all for being here today. The current members of the Academy's Executive Committee are Albert Brewer, Ed Bridges, Tom Carruthers, Mason Davis, Barbara Larson, Wallace Malone, Vaughn Marset, John Patterson, Kathy Randall, and Mike Warren. Is there a motion and second for their re-election? Thank you, Ms. Pfeiffer. Is there a second? Second. Thank you very much. Is there discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. The motion passes unanimously. The Academy has lost some extraordinary members since our last induction. We honor their memories today and give thanks for the enormous difference that they have made in this state. Jeremiah Denton, former U.S. Senator, U.S. Navy Rear Admiral, and POW. Willard Hurley, former chairman and CEO of First Alabama Bank Shares. John McKinley, former CEO of Texaco. Joe Moquin, former president of the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Jim Pittman, former dean of the School of Medicine at UAB. Yetta Samford, former state senator. His daughter Katie and grandson Farah Alford are with us today. We thank you deeply for sharing this great man with all of us. And Joab Thomas, former president of the University of Alabama, Penn State, and North Carolina State Universities. His wife Marley and daughter Dr. Jennifer Bolton join us today. We are so grateful to you for being here. His extraordinary service was made possible in large part by your loving support. Oh, how grateful we are to have been touched by their lives. Thank you. We now turn to honoring eight others who have made this state and nation a better place, the newly inducted members of the Alabama Academy of Honor. Executive member and distinguished lawyer Mason Davis will read and present a citation to each new member. Would you please come forward as soon as Mr. Davis begins reading your citation to stand here and remain standing until a photo is taken at the end of your citation. Tim Cook will speak on behalf of the new class at the end. Mr. Davis. Thank you so very much, Dr. Randall. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to do this job for you. I hope I don't stumble, because about a month ago, I suffered a detached retina, 
and I can see out of it, but it doesn't give good vision. I will call the name of each inductee. I will read your citation, and as Dr. Randall has instructed you, if you would come up after I call your name, then you will be presented with the citation. Judith L. Bonner for being born in Alabama and being raised in rural Wilcox County for attending the University of Alabama and earning a Bachelor of Science degree in 1969 and a Master of Science in 1972, for earning her PhD from Ohio State University in 1970 six, for becoming the first woman president and the 28th president of the University of Alabama in 2012, as well as the first woman, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to be named president of one of the 14 universities that make up the Southeastern Conference, for making the University of Alabama a premier student-centered research university and one of the top 50 public universities in the country for serving on the board of directors of the Chamber of Commerce of West Alabama, Tuscaloosa County Industrial Development Authority, National Merit Corporation and Air University for her many personal accomplishments to include Delta Gamma Cream Colored Rose Award in 2014, Algernon Sidney Sullivan Award, 2010 ODK, that's Omicron Delta Kappa, Francis S. Somersell Award, 2010, Amanda Grace Taylor Watson Distinguished Image Award in 2007, and Carlton K. Butler Service to the University Award 2006 for her induction into the Ohio State University Hall of Fame in 2013 and receiving the Distinguished Alumna Award in 1995 for providing bold, visionary leadership for Alabama's capstone of higher education during a period of unprecedented growth, both in size and quality, for her studies in human nutrition and her research focusing on eating disorders and on the nutritional needs of chronically ill children and research that will impact the lives of Alabama for generations to come. Judith L. Judy Bonner is elected to the Alabama Academy of Honor. Next is Timothy Cook. For being born and raised in Robertsdale, Alabama, for graduating from Robertsdale High School in 1978, for entering Auburn University and earning a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering in 1982, for earning an MBA from Duke University in 1988 and being named a Fuquay Scholar, an honor bestowed only on business students who graduate in the top 10% of their class. For becoming a senior executive at IBM and at Compaq, which at the time was the largest computer company in the world. For joining Apple, in 1998 as the Senior Vice President 
for worldwide operations and later as executive vice president of worldwide sales and operations for serving as Apple's chief operating officer from 2005 to 2011 and as head of Apple's Macintosh computer division, playing a key role in the continued development of strategic reseller and supplier relationships, for being named chief executive officer of Apple in 2011 and increasing Apple's charitable giving and improvement of working condition, conditions for millions of workers in the company's supply chain, for being the founding chair of the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering Alumni Council at Auburn University, establishing the ISE Endowed Fund for Excellence, the Tim Cook Leadership Scholarship for undergraduate students, and the Tim Cook Pro Professorship in Industrial and Systems Engineering, for being awarded numerous lifetime achievements awards to include the 2014 Lifetime Achievement Award from Auburn Alumni Association, Fortune's 2014 list of world's 50 greatest scholars, and Times 2012 Person of the Year for becoming one of the most recognized and respected names in the business and technology Worlds. Timothy Cook is elected to the Alabama Academy of Honor. James R. Hudson, Jr. For being raised in Huntsville, Alabama, for graduating from Huntsville High School in 1960, for earning a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a master's degree in physics from the University of Alabama, and a master's degree in biology from the University of Alabama, Huntsville, for serving as an officer in the United States Army Corps of Engineers from 1967 and earning the Distinguished Flying Cross for missions over North Vietnam, for operating Hudson Medals with his father and brother and helping elevate the company to one of the most productive small foundries in the Southeast for founding Research Genetics in 1987, which became a chief partner in the Human Genome Project to identify the sequence of the DNA found inside human cells, for co-founding Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology in 2000, a nonprofit research institute that uses biotechnology to improve human health, stimulate economic development, and inspire the next generation of scientists. For co-finding the Biotechnology Association of Alabama, where he served as its first president for initiating a number of projects to revitalize downtown Huntsville to include transforming the old low mill cotton mill into the low mill arts and entertainment center. For serving as an adjunct professor at the University of Alabama Huntsville, a member of the College of Science Advisory Council, the board of directors of the UAH Foundation, Board of Directors of the Economic Development Partnership of Alabama Foundation, the Huntsville Rotary Club, 
and the Committee of 100 for positioning Alabama to become a worldwide leader in biotech research for contributing to the revitalization of Huntsville and supporting the arts. James R. Hudson is elected to the Alabama Academy of Honor. Margaret Marks Porter. For being born in Birmingham, Alabama, for attending Brook Hill School in Birmingham, and graduating from Hollins College in Roanoke, Virginia. For being an active member of the Mountain Brook Parks and Recreation Board and coordinating the creation of the Crestline Tot Lot and several other community play parks. For serving as vice chairman of the steering committee that developed the Mountain Brook Athletic Park at the high school. For serving on the Mountain Brook City Council for 12 years, during which time she served as president and president pro tem of the city council mayor and council liaison to the Mountain Brook Board of Education for creating and leading a fundraising campaign that raised $43 million for Birmingham's McWain Science Center and serving as chairman of the board for the McWain Center as president and chief executive officer for being active with the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and helping raise $389 million for the school. For serving as a member of the Board of Trustees and Children's Hospital of Alabama and the Children's Health System of Alabama and advocating for children's health funding on the national level. For serving as a member of numerous organizations such as the Eyesight Foundation of Alabama, Leadership Alabama, and the Women's Fund, and other such organizations for the benefit of all Alabama. For her many community service accomplishments such as the Woman of Distinction Award by the Girl Scouts 1996 Mountain Brook Citizen of the Year, Paul Harris Fellow by the Rotary International, and other distinguished awards. Margaret Marks Porter is elected to the Alabama Academy of Honor. Nick Saban. For being born October 31st, 1951 in Fairmont, West Virginia. For entering Kent State University and graduating with a bachelor's degree in business in 1973. For later earning a master's degree in sports administration from Kent State University in 1975, for pursuing his coaching profession on the collegiate and professional level with the University of Toledo, the Cleveland Browns, Michigan State University, Louisiana State University, Miami Dolphins, and the University of Alabama. For consistent and disciplined leadership on and off the field, guiding his teams to become known for their grit, determination, and resilience, often overcoming adversity to achieve victory. 
for winning four national titles in the modern era as head coach at Louisiana State and the University of Alabama, and being a five-time National Coach of the Year for co-authoring Tiger Turnaround in 2001 on LSU football and How Good Do You Want to Be in 2005, a book that offers real-life principles for success at work and at home, for creating Nick's Kids Fund for disadvantaged children and for distributing more than $5 million to more than 150 charities through the Nick's Kids Fund and for his charitable work with the Children's Miracle Network, for assisting in the construction of 15 homes with Project Team Up and Habitat Humanity following the 9th, April 27, 2011, Tuscaloosa tornado, for donating a $1 million gift to benefit Alabama's first generation scholarship program, for being a successful author and philanthropist, an outstanding tactician, leader, and motivator, Nick L. Saban is elected to the Alabama Academy of Honor. <laughs> Jefferson B. Sessions. For being born in Selma, on December 24, 1946, and being raised in rural High Bark and attending schools in nearby Camden, for working his way through Huntington College and earning a Bachelor of Arts in History in 1969, for earning his Juris Doctorate from the University of Alabama in 1973, and practicing law in Russellville and serving two years as assistant United States attorney. For serving in the United States Army Reserve from 1975 to 1986 and attaining the rank of captain. For being nominated by President Ronald Reagan to serve as United States attorney for the Southern District of Alabama a position he held for 12 years, for being elected Alabama Attorney General in 1994 and elected to the United States Senate in 1997, for currently serving as ranking member of the Senate Budget Committee and previously served as ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, senior member of the Armed Services Committee and on the Environment and Public Works Committee for his many major legislation and actions, which included the addition of the Mountain Longleaf National Wildlife Refuge near Anniston to the National Wildlife Refuge System, wilderness protection for Duggar Mountain and the Talladega National Forest and reauthorization of the Victims of Child Abuse Act to fund children's advocacy centers for receiving numerous awards to include the Reserve Officers Association, Minute Man of the Year Award, Alabama Farmers Federation Services to Agriculture Award, and Department of the Navy Distinguished Public Service Award for a public service career that has emphasized maintaining a strong military, good stewardship of public money, the preservation of our legal system, our nation's defense, the environment, and the well-being of all Alabamians. Jefferson B. Sessions 
is elected to the Alabama Academy of Honor. I knew that I was going to get me in trouble. John Frank Croyle. I didn't intend. <laughs> For being March 9, 1951 in Gadsden, Alabama, for being an excellent athlete, excelling at baseball, basketball, and football. For attending the University of Alabama and graduating in 1974. For being a scholarship football player for the University of Alabama in 1969. And being a significant contributor to SEC championship teams of 1971, 73, and 73 and the national championship team of 1973 under the leadership of coach Paul Bear Bryant. For working as a youth counselor at King's Arrow Ranch for boys in Lumberton, Mississippi during his college years where he led a young boy to Christianity by teaching him biblical lessons that would change the young boy's life for the better. For founding the Big, Old, uh, the Big Oak Boys Ranch in 1974, Big Oak Girls Ranch in 1988, and acquiring the Westbrook Christian School in 1990 with the goal of helping children. For promising every child under his care, I love you, I'll never lie to you. I'll stick with you until you're grown. There are boundaries. Don't cross them. For believing these four principles over the bread rocks to parenting a child, love and emotional support, truth, security, and discipline. For the many personal accomplishments to include being the first recipient of the Paul W. Bryant Alumni Athlete Award in 1988, Olympic torchbearer in 1996, and the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame in 2002 for writing, bringing out the winner in your child in 1995. The two minute drill to manhood in 2013 and raising a princess in 2014 for developing his life to the service of others and being a father to nearly 2,000 of Alabama's children over the years. John Frank Croyle is elected to the Alabama Academy of Honor. Thank you for being patient, and I did not, and I'm sorry that I, <laughs> I'm sorry that I, I, I made that mistake, and I'm not going to lay it on this eye. <laughs> w. Edgar Weldon. For being born on January 23rd, 1943 in Wetumpka, for being a 1961 graduate of Wetumpka High School, 
for attending the University of Alabama and graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree in 1965 from the School of Commerce and Business Administration for starting a family business with his brother and father that would become one of the most successful real estate development, mortgage and property management companies in the Southeast. For his 50 years of public service, through his work with the Republican Party and the state of Alabama, including representing Alabama on the Republican National Committee for 12 years from 1996 through 2008. For volunteering his time and services to the state of Alabama as the director of the Alabama Development Office and the Alabama Department of Economic and Community Affairs and as special assistant to the governor for economic affairs. For serving on numerous boards and foundations to include chairman of the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame and Museum, Birmingham Athletic Partnership, which provided Birmingham City Schools with over two and a half million dollars in financial support, and the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports, to name a few. For being selected as Alabama Citizen of the Year in 1987, receiving the National Governors Association Award for Distinguished Service to State Government in 1992, entering the Alabama High School Sports Hall of Fame in 2007, and recently the Board of Directors of the National Football Foundation. For being a dedicated businessman, statesman, and volunteer involved with numerous projects that benefits Alabama's young people, their schools, and communities. W. Edgar Weldon is elected to the Alabama Academy of Honor. Good morning, everyone. You know, I'm informal too, like Governor Bentley. The only rules I've got are that you can applaud at any time, <laughs> save your booze until five minutes after I complete, and you can take my photo if you have an Apple logo on your device. <laughs> and Mr. Davis, I'd be glad to give you a lesson on iPad after the event so you don't have to worry about those pesky notes anymore. <laughs> Governor Bentley, Dr. Randall, members of the Academy, and friends, I am honored to be with you today, and it's a special privilege to speak on behalf of this group of inductees. I'm sure all of the Alabama fans would have much preferred to hear from Coach Saban today, <laughs> but hopefully there are at least a few Auburn fans out there who don't mind listening to me. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I am truly humbled to be included with these individuals. Each of them have brought such distinction to the state with all of their achievements and leadership. I love the state. Alabama has always been very special to me, and I continue to think of it as home. Growing up in Baldwin County in Robertsdale provided me a solid foundation and grounding that has remained with me for a lifetime. My time as a kid and a young adult in Alabama taught me the importance of family, of friends, of community, of education, and hard work. These values continue to guide me decades later. And yes, I fell in love with football, Auburn football that is, <laughs> and this too should remain with me a lifetime. I've been fortunate in my life to have traveled to many different places in the world. 
In those travels, I've had the privilege to be exposed to different languages, different cultures, and different perspectives. But I'm most often struck by the things we share, a desire for respect, a desire to matter, a desire to be accepted for who we are. For those of us in Alabama, it's a desire that has been front and center in the civil rights movement for decades. This year marks the 50th anniversary of President Lyndon Johnson's signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I'd like to use my time this morning reflecting on our progress and our challenges. We're all familiar with the historical struggle of our African-American brothers and sisters for equal rights. I could never understand why some within our state and nation resisted basic principles of human dignity that was so opposite the values I had learned growing up in Robertsdale, Alabama in a family that was rich in love and respect. Decades later, I still don't understand. My parents worked hard so we could have a better life, go to college, and become whatever we wanted. They moved to Alabama because they found friends and neighbors that shared their values, and I saw that. I also saw, as many of you did, that it was a time of great struggle across our state and our nation. It deeply impacted me and helped define who I am today. As I stand here in the Capitol, I am reminded of all of those who came before us, those who fought for change and those who resisted it. This morning, I visited Dexter Avenue Baptist Church where Dr. Martin Luther King rallied a congregation, a state, and ultimately a nation. I have long admired Dr. King, and it was a deeply moving experience. Dr. King once said, our lives to begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. There is little, if anything, that matters more in our country than our basic tenets of equality and human rights. I have long promised myself to never be silent in my beliefs in regard to these tenets. Although there has been much progress our state and our nation still have a long way to go before Dr. King's dream is a reality. As a state, we took too long to take steps toward equality, and once we began, our progress was too slow. Too slow on equality for African Americans. Too slow on interracial marriage, which was only legalized 14 years ago and still too slow on equality for the LGBT community. Under the law, citizens of Alabama can still be fired based on their sexual orientation. We can't change the past, but we can learn from it, and we can create a different future. One of the greatest civil rights issues of our time is the lack of equal access to quality education, and this is where I'd like to focus today. I am the product of a public school system. The same is true for a number of the other inductees. Growing up in Robertsdale, I had access to a good school system and teachers who really cared. It was education that allowed me to stand on the shoulders and dream big, and when dreaming big, was combined with hard work, anything became possible. This is the American dream, and it is what distinguishes our country from most other nations on the planet. Today, too many kids are denied access to a quality education in pursuit of their American dream due to the zip code they live in. They're born with a built-in headwind and to a fate they did not choose. This isn't right. It isn't just. And it isn't a reflection 
of our deepest values. Education is a fundamental human right for everyone. And yet there is great disparity in our schools and our education systems. Many schools struggle to provide the basics despite dedicated efforts of teachers and families. A lack of equal access to technology and knowledge places entire communities and populations of students at a disadvantage, especially minorities. At Apple, we have always believed that education is the great equalizer, and we want to help change this. We want to open the vast potential of all of the world's future innovators, future dreamers, and future leaders. As a company founded and built on the idea that technology placed in the hands of the many has the power to change the world, we at Apple view it our responsibility to step up and act. Earlier this year, we joined the White House in a bipartisan initiative to enrich K-12 education. As a part of this initiative, Apple will be donating $100 million to schools that need it the most. Today, we're announcing the recipients of this gift. It's 114 schools in more than 29 states around the country where we believe we can make a difference. And I'm happy to tell you that five schools are right here in Alabama. <laughs> These schools span three different school districts, and they are in some of the, the most economically disadvantaged communities. Three of these schools are just down the road in Macon County. It's where Rosa Parks was born, the Tuskegee Airmen took flight, and Booker T. Washington rose from slavery to advocate for change. I'm thrilled to be joined this morning by the principals of all three schools, along with their superintendent and the county's technology coordinator. Why don't they stand and rise? Great. Tuskegee Elementary School was founded on segregation principles and was finally integrated in the 1960s. Today, Principal Tiffany Williams School is home to 325 fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, 100% of whom are minority and all of whom are eligible for the country's free or reduced lunch program. These students have minimal access to technology, just 25 computers that are more than a decade old in a computer lab. At Notasolga High School, students share a single set of 10-year-old textbooks between two classrooms because they don't have enough funds for each student to have his or her own textbook. Principal Brenda Sullivan told us access to Apple's technology would encourage parents, students, and the entire community to strive for a brighter future. And A.J. Wilson, the principal at Booker T. Washington High School in Macon County, told us he is most inspired by the students who go the extra distance to earn their diplomas, despite the incredible odds against them, including poverty, learning disabilities, and family struggles. For Macon County students in many communities across the country, the schools are the lifelines for the communities. Despite the many different challenges the schools and students and educators are met with, they all share one thing, hope. We chose these schools not only for the incredible odds they are against, but because despite those odds, they have a vision and the teachers of the school are passionate about helping kids. We share their vision and we're going to help them bring it to life. Not only will we give them cutting edge technology they so desperately need, but we're also gonna give them access to the most valuable thing we have at Apple, our people. We're going to send our education teams to help them create new ways of learning, 
our retail teams to bring them popular coding camps. And we're going to leverage some of the world's best minds from Apple University to create new courses. I think back to my own school days at Robertsdale High School, and I could never have imagined that years later, I would be standing here in the Capitol, speaking with all of you, and being inducted into the Academy of Honor alongside such accomplished individuals. Everyone deserves this chance. I encourage all of you and every member of the Academy to do their part in assuring equal access to quality education for every student in Alabama. In order to bring meaningful change to our educational system, we will have to confront difficult truths and have difficult conversations around topics that not everyone will agree. But we must have these conversations, conversations that lead to action. We must take to heart the words spoken by Atticus Fetch, the hero of To Kill a Mockingbird, written by Harper Lee, who herself was inducted to this academy in 2001. The best way to clear the air is to have it all out in the open. We are fortunate that so many inspiring leaders from this state have supported the expansion of civil rights under the law. All of us now share the responsibility of making everyone equal in truth. Let's do it together. Let's do what we must do for Alabama to realize its deepest values and highest aspirations. Thank you and Godspeed. Tim Cook, what a thrill it was to hear from you and to have you back in Alabama. Please come back more. Wonderful. To welcome the new members on behalf of the current members, we have Jim Stevens, chairman of EBSCO, a company with $2.4 billion, billion in revenue and providing jobs for over 6,000 employees. EBSCO is one of the 200 largest privately held companies in the United States. Of its over 40 diversified business units, its primary businesses include providing journal and magazine subscription services to libraries and corporations, and the manufacturing of fishing lures and hunting-related products. Jim Stevens has the guiding belief that a society's goodness is defined by the average and the lowest level quality of life achieved for its citizens. And its greatest asset is a system which furthers meritocracy and avoids unearned privilege. Jim's estate plan bequeaths his estate, accepting some real property, to a foundation with the gift of giving its content within 10 to 15 years. He maintains almost 100 scholarships for college students with financial need and academic worth and supports a wide variety of charitable endeavors from UNICEF and Doctors Without Borders to God's Outreach Center in Harpersville, Alabama. EBSCO is an extraordinarily charitable corporation because of his leadership, contributing 5% of before-tax profits to charity and matching each dollar of employee contributions to the United Way with $1.50 from the company. This graduate of Yale University and of Harvard's MBA program came back to Alabama to make a difference. 
and through his extraordinary business leadership and exemplary generosity, he has succeeded brilliantly in making an enormous difference in our state. Thank you, Jim, for this difference and for representing the current members of the Academy as you speak to us today. Jim Stevens. Governor Bentley, uh, elected officials, members of the Academy, and guests. Uh, my first order of business is to report a private survey I commissioned among global nonprofit organizations in order to ascertain the one which had the most, uh, the chairman with the most grace and charm. And I am pleased to report that the Alabama Academy of Honor is victorious. My charge was to speak about whatever I wish to. And for my presentation, I turned to my college degree and my choice for reading since college, diplomatic and military history. I will start with the lighter side of life and then get into the presentation. Dr. Neil Birdie, a, a friend of mine and a member of this academy, has a collection of church bulletin misprints, and I would like to share three. Low self-esteem groups will meet Thursday at 7 p.m. Please use the back door. <laughs> the ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind and they may be seen in the church basement Friday afternoon. <laughs> the pastor will preach his farewell sermon, after which the choir will sing Break Forth into Joy. <laughs> the premise of my talk is simply that war is the most humanly devastating activity in which humankind can engage. It is said we humans tend to block out uncomfortable facts, inconvenient truths, and sometimes the suffering of other peoples. Only by remembering the truth of war can we usher forth the patience the tolerance and the wisdom to make it as infrequent and as minimal as possible. Let me start with a few words about the two world wars. In July of 2014, just three months ago, we marked the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the First World War. The Second War was a direct outgrowth of the First War. World War I started because of the incompetent political leadership in five European nations and was triggered by the assassination of two members of a royal family. This was the last war primarily fought in the countryside and probably the last in human history to be fought without the aerial bombardment of civilian populations. From the start of World War I until the end of World War II, only an amazingly short 31 years transpired. During that 31 years, it is hard to believe that 84 million people lost their lives as a direct result of the two wars. 16 million in World War I and 68 million in World War II. In the Second War, 35 million died from, uh, in, within the military, and 33 million civilians died. These two constitute the worst human disaster in the last several hundred years. I would like to make two particular comments. These wars occurred mainly in the Christian world. And if those of us in the West thought that our culture put a higher premium on human life than some others. We need ponder. Next, I will mention the most important battle 
of the war, the Battle of Kursk, not well known in the West. It took place 280 miles southwest of Moscow. On one side were 1.9 million Russian soldiers, and on the other side, 900,000 German soldiers. 8,000 tanks were deployed. At the end of the battle, 250,000 German soldiers had lost their lives and 425,000 Russian soldiers. But the German General Guderian said, the initiative has passed, and the Russians rolled directly to Berlin. After World War II, and between 1945 and 2001, there were three, there are three continuous and significant diplomatic engagements by the United States on which I would like to comment. First, Palestine. In the 1850s, Palestine was inhabited by 300,000 Muslims, 27,000 Christians, and 13,000 Jews. In the 1880s, a nationalist movement, Zionism, originated in Central Europe, which sought a territorial homeland for the Jewish people. In 1917, the British government put their support behind this aspiration. Only two years later, Foreign Minister Balfour wrote a prominent Zionist, may I take this opportunity of stating frankly that the situation in Palestine is giving me considerable anxiety. Reports are reaching me from unbiased sources that the Zionists are behaving in such a way which is alienating the sympathies of all other elements of the population. Palestine has been a cauldron of conflict with which the USA has been involved since. In 1947, the UN partitioned Palestine between the Arabs and the Jews. In 1948, Israel declared itself a nation. In 1948, President Truman, although he found the notion of a nation uh, founded on a religion disagreeable, provided American diplomatic recognition to Israel. Israel's European antecedents brought with them a talent for science and technology, and they have militarily dominated the more agricultural Arabs in the area since that time. American support for Israel has been unqualified. Our diplomacy has worked tirelessly to bring about peaceful coexistence in the area. However, we have not been able to cap that effort with the even-handedness and fair play which would result in a Palestinian state. Our success depends on the governance in Israel. Under Yitzhak Rabin, a peace seeker, we made great progress. Under Netanyahu, our diplomats are virtually insulted and settlements continue to creep eastward. Europe is tiring of the perpetual and brutal conflict. The nation of Sweden has indicated they will recognize a Palestinian state, and the British Parliament recently voted in a non-binding vote to recognize a Palestinian state. Tim, as you can see, I, I don't have a, an iPad here. Um, let's see. Moving from Palestine, let me say a word about Iran. In 1906, a nation which had been under a monarchy for over 2,000 years had a constitutional revolt and created a parliament. The parliament shared power with the Shah. In 1909, a young man from a prominent family left Iran and went to Paris for education. A few years later, he graduated with a PhD in law from a university in Switzerland. He returned, was elected to parliament, served as both the foreign minister and the finance minister. In 1951, he was elected prime minister by the parliament. Mohammad Mossadegh remains today Iran's most revered political leader in recent times. Time magazine in 1950 selected him as the man of the year. About that same time, the American oil company, Aramco, had renegotiated oil revenues with the nation of Saudi Arabia and split these 50-50. However, 
the British-controlled Anglo-Iranian oil company was not willing and would not budge as Mossadegh thought that the Iranian people deserved a better share of their own oil. Tensions mounted. The British urged us to uh, assist with the overthrow of Mossadegh. We empowered and funded the CIA to do so. It succeeded, and he was taken from office. The young Shah returned Iran to a monarchy and uh, had a secret police force named the Savak that kept things under control. In 1979, the common people of Iran prevailed. The Shah was overthrown and exiled, and a theocracy under the, under the bitterly anti-Western Ayatollah Khomeini came to Iran. Past actions have made it difficult for us to have a level of trust which would make possible good working relationships with the nation of Iran. Third, I would mention Russia. Seventy-three years of the experiment with communism and the Berlin Wall became history in 1989. One year later, our Secretary of State, James Baker, was in Moscow to speak with Gorbachev and talk NATO. His notes from that meeting unified Germany, anchored in a revamped NATO whose jurisdiction would not move eastward. The North American diplomat, probably most revered in the last hundred years, is George Kennan, who was, who was tossed out of the Soviet Union at one time by Stalin and became later the author of the American policy of containment of Russian, of Russian communism. In 1998, when the Senate was approving the first eastward movement of NATO, Kennan said, I think it is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this. No one was threatening anyone else. In the same interview, Kennan predicted that NATO expansion would provoke crisis, at which time the proponents of expansion would then say, we always told you how the Russians are. Sadly, we created a self-fulfilling prophecy by expanding NATO and continuing to treat Russia as a threat, but it was a threat that, has, that had ended. In 1812, the Russians took Paris in answer to Napoleon. In 1945, the Russians took Berlin in answer to Hitler. In the nations of Georgia and the Ukraine, the West pushed too far. We are in an age of street impeachment. The illegal overthrow of the democratically elected president of the Ukraine like him or not, is rightly labeled a coup and has proven the final straw whereby the Crimea has been taken by Russia, eastern Ukraine is destabilized, and in Europe and Russia both, there is econo economic dislocation because sanctions cut both ways. When one is victorious, it is important how the vanquished are handled. We won the Cold War. We left Russia by unfortunate design on the periphery of Europe. A young officer in East Germany in 1989 recalled 10 years later his bitterness on returning to Moscow and realizing that Russia had been put on the periphery of Europe. His name was Vladimir Putin. He now possesses the power to do as he views. He is an able strategist. As yet, it is unknown to what extent we played a role in Georgia and played a role in the Ukraine. But it is very clear that it is the Russians and not the West who will determine what is a threat to them. The USA has been a supreme power since World War II. And we have become a kind of global caretaker against some needs and for some needs. Whether our caretaking needs adjusting is up to us. What since the terrible event of September 
2001. As an American, I personally very much dislike that we started both the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. Our country has not traditionally been one that starts wars. The Afghan people were not al-Qaeda. Iraq was impatience and a mistake. The score, 133,000 dead Iraqi civilians, 20,000 dead Afghan civilians, 4 million refugees living in some way away from their home, our own dead and wounded, $2 trillion spent so far with pretty much nothing to show for it. We finance that by debt. Following our several press notices and quotes from within the last two months concerning Iraq, American officials had asserted that the $14 billion that the United States had spent on the Iraqi security forces would prepare their 200,000-man army to safeguard the country after American troops left. These officials were forced to ponder images from Mosul, Iraq's second largest city of a million people, of ISIS militants parading around in Humvees after having taken Mosul with 500 to 800 fighters. General Mo Mohammed Dulami, the commander of the 12th Iraqi Division in Kirkuk, the Americans have really disappointed us by not supplying the Iraqi army with the weapons and support it needs to fight terrorism. A friend of mine who is a retired FBI agent refer referenced uh, ISIS, religiously inspired fighters don't balk. An Iraqi taxi driver, we had a very strong government back then. Saddam's regime was far better than the current situation. An Iraqi citizen, the prescription for Iraq's chaos is to revert to the past when all power was in one man's hand. Someone like Saddam has to bring law and order to Iraq. In the Wall Street Journal, President Reagan's speechwriter, Peggy Noonan, wrote, the American people do not believe the architects of Iraq told them the full truth in the past or are candid now, more than 11 years after the invasion. Their blame laying sounds less like strength than spin. They are like Talleyrand is said to have observed about the Bourbons, that they have learned nothing and forgotten nothing. When you are catastrophically wrong, you have to bring a certain humility to the table. Lastly, let me repeat, war is the most humanly devastating activity in which humankind can engage. It is said we humans have a tendency to block out uncomfortable facts, inconvenient truths, and the suffering of others. Avoidance and not knowing is not an option. Only by remembering the truth of war can we usher forth the patience, tolerance, and wisdom to make it as infrequent and minimal as possible? Now, in closing, back to the lighter side of life. I will take a big jump from diplomatic and military history to the down-home world of country music. I am indebted to my friend Jimmy Guin for his collection of country music song titles. And I share the following with you, which you may wish to put on your playlist. Number one, her teeth was stained, but her heart was pure. <laughs> I'm so miserable without you, it's like having you here. <laughs> How can I miss you if you don't go away? If you leave me, can I come too? Congratulations to the new inductees and thank you.
Thank you so much, Jim. We have a couple of announcements in closing. Several years ago, the Academy's immediate past chairman, Tom Carruthers, lamented the fact that the members only met once each year and began offering a purely social spring event. What a thrill we had this year. The Honorable Fred Gray opened his hometown of Tuskegee to us as only he and Carol could, including special visits to the Tuskegee Airmen Museum, Booker T. Washington's home, Tuskegee's Multicultural Center, and so many other wonderful events. Then, Jay and Susie Googe rolled out the red carpet for us at Auburn University, the one that he leads so brilliantly, showing us, for example, the groundbreaking research being done in the Shelby Center of their College of Engineering, and introducing us to the world-renowned, brilliant, and in some cases adorable bomb-sniffing dogs, to the War Eagle, and to Auburn's football and basketball coaches and facilities. Well, in 2015, the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the Academy, we'll be celebrating with dinner in the East Room of the White House with Patrick Henry and Benjamin Franklin. Now, full disclosure, it will be in the exact replica of the East Room at one of Alabama's great treasures, the American Village in Montevallo. Its visionary founder and director, Tom Walker, will host our visit where we will see firsthand the transformative effect on children's love of country by their visits to the village. Also, we will tour a few of the more than 150 remarkable creations of the rural studio in the Black Belt. Rural Studio gives Auburn University architecture students a more hands-on educational experience while assisting an underserved population in West Alabama's Black Belt region. Members, please save the dates of April 21st and 22nd for what should be a wonderful time in that area of our beloved Alabama. In just a few moments, we will adjourn to the luncheon in honor of the new inductees and their families across the street in the State Archives building. We offer our deepest thanks to the staff of the Alabama Department of Archives and History for making all of the arrangements for today, especially to Dr. Steve Murray, State Archivist, ably assisted by Georgia Ann Connor and Steve Wheat. We are also indebted to the University of Alabama's Chancellor Bob Witt and Associate Chancellor Kelly Reinhardt for making possible the coordination of communication and media for today, and to the clerk of the House of Representatives, Jeff Woodard, for the use of this historic chamber. Because we won't all arrive at lunch at the same time, please go ahead and proceed to enjoying your lunch once you arrive. These will be the last formal remarks today. Now, before adjournment, will our eight inductees and our governor please come forward for a group photograph and for one last round of congratulatory applause. And now, this 43rd induction ceremony of the Academy of Honor is adjourned for our luncheon at the Archives Building. Thank you very much. <laughs>